let's go and get started here. So um, I want to welcome pretty much everyone to the first in a larger series that we're doing as a part of the SAGE's leadership, what was designated um, to be something that we do essentially in our downtime, in which we uh, take several sessions over several weeks and part of the SAGE's Master's Call Director group on Facebook, the objective is to use some of the time that we are to have some very deep dives and panel discussions about specific topics that, that are cutting edge and things that are uh, uh, vexing us, uh, if you will. And so tonight we're going to really talk about something that is really, you know, uh, affecting every single one of us in the field of colorectal surgery, the field of general surgery, the field ever, ever across all the subspecialties of surgery in general surgery and across medicine in general. And it's truly focusing on specifically COVID-19 and how we as colorectal surgeons and specifically how we as minimally invasive surgeons approach this. Now, many of you probably have seen there's lots of tweets, lots of Facebook posts, lots of seminars, lots of webinars that are going into tremendous detail um, and very murky data, very difficult data that are talking about, is laparoscopy safe? Is it unsafe? Should we do surgery open? Should we do it closed? What do we do and how do we do it to get our patients and our fellows and our surgeons and our staff through the operation during this era of COVID-19? And hence, that's why we're doing this webinar tonight. So what I want to do is I want to start by introducing our panel. And really, what we're going to have tonight is a breakdown uh, of uh, three master physicians in their respective fields. And so the first discussion is gonna be by Dr. Enaba Maldonado, and we'll get to him in just a second. We're gonna really talk about coronavirus for the surgeons, the basics of coronavirus. And then we're gonna talk about the current best practices for perioperative testing and care, uh, brought by my friend and mentor, Dr. Amir Bistaros. And finally, Dr. Sami Chatty will talk to us about the current evidence for minimally invasive surgery during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we'll close this off with a panel discussion and um, Q&A. And so our first speaker is a board certified infectious disease physician. He's the medical director of the antimicrobial stewardship program in Advent Health Altamont. And he's gonna speak to us, as I mentioned, uh, about the coronavirus, the basics of virology for the surgeon. And so to that end, I'm gonna take my screen share and give it to Dr. Maldonado about the basics of um, virology. Uh, Annabelle, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mark. So just briefly, um, thank you for the opportunity. We're just gonna touch base on uh, what coronaviruses uh, are and um, you know, feel free to uh, ask me any questions at the end of my discussion or a little uh, bit later during the discussion session. Coronavirus one other, so, so sorry to interrupt, Annabelle. I just want to make sure that everyone's aware that uh, we're constantly monitoring the, the Sages Colorectal webinar on the Sages Colorectal Facebook page. So as you're, as you're watching the webinar, please feel free to chime in and ask any questions. We're going to be answering them as we go throughout. Sorry about that, Annabelle. No worries. So, uh, you know, coronaviruses are important human and animal pathogens. We've, uh, we've known about them since 1965. Uh, they are RNA viruses different from your DNA viruses like herpes or Epstein-Barr viruses. They're small to medium sized particles surrounded by, um, by an outer uh, membrane uh, with uh, characteristic spikes called the S proteins from which um, they get the, uh, their characteristic name of a coronavirus or crown. They're divided into alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. The ones that we are concerned about are in the beta coronavirus class. And those include the uh, SARS coronavirus one, uh, which was described in, the, in 2002. Uh, it also includes the Middle Eastern uh, coronavirus described in 2012. And most recently, our, uh, our uh, SARS coronavirus 2 or COVID-19 described in the, uh, Wuhan in the late December. They're usually seasonal viruses with the majority of the infections seen during the winter. Uh, and they, are, uh, they account for about 15% of, uh, of the regular colds um, are, so, are, uh, are, are secondary to coronavirus. 
So mostly upper uh, respiratory tract infections in immunosuppressed patients, then you can see some lower respiratory tract infections and possibly some gastrointestinal disease usually manifested by diarrhea, usually self-limiting, requiring, non, requiring, non, requiring not, no specific intervention. There's no specific treatment. There's no agent that has proven efficacy against coronaviruses at this time. Uh, the route of transmission, I'm sure, is something that you guys are interested in. And in general, uh, we we've, we've think about these viruses as person-to-person uh, -person droplet and uh, transmitted by fomites. Um, keep in mind that this, this route of transmission, um, uh, 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 the way we describe this comes from the 1930s. So we've, we've simplified the ways these viruses have been transmitted into airborne and, and droplet. But, but it comes to, to know that it's, it's, it's quite more complicated than that. Uh, we, we recently saw a New England Journal of Medicine uh, letter to the editor, which described the presence of the virus uh, in the air for approximately three hours, as well as some of the other surfaces like stainless steel and plastic for 72 hours. Now, how viable and how infective this virus is when it's in those surfaces uh, still remains to be seen. The more you read the literature at this time, it's so dynamic and so fluid that, uh, that one could get you know, quite confused uh, when reading the literature regarding this topic at this time. Uh, some key considerations, and some of you uh, may, talk or may uh, touch base on this, but uh, short of not doing any surgical interventions, you are at risk as a surgeon for uh, being exposed to this virus. The virus has been isolated in multiple tissues, uh, the blood, sputum, GI tissue, multiple surfaces, including shoe covers. Uh, we don't know uh, how transmissible it is in surgical smoke. We've read the literature in the past about some viruses like hepatitis B, human papilloma viruses being present uh, on surgical smoke and actually causing some infections uh, with these viruses. Now keep in mind uh, the pathogenicity and the transmission of the hepatitis B and the human papilloma viruses are quite different from this coronavirus, but just knowing that some of these particles may be present on surgical smoke is quite concerning. The bottom line is for SARS coronavirus to COVID-19, we just don't know, we just don't know. So the, the key considerations for surgery, I have to emphasize in the, in the 10 minutes that I have, just make sure your institution has established protocols for transport, whether that's from room to the pre-op, to the pre-op or the OR suite, uh, or to the OR suite to the post-op. You have to assume that the entire operating room will be contaminated with these viruses. Uh, with this virus, uh, you would prefer to have negative pressure rooms if you have the capacity to do that. Uh, but if you're not able to use a negative pressure room and you have positive pressure room, please allow the room to be at least clean for, for 30 minutes or decontaminated for 30 minutes. Now, I just mentioned that the virus may be airborne for three hours. So, so that 30 minute uh, mark uh, may, may just not be enough. Uh, the, uh, the amount of personnel that has contact in the OR uh, when you're doing these cases should be extremely limited. Movement should be limited. Anything that comes in contact with the patient should be considered contaminated. And equipment that, that has not, even equipment that has not been used should also be considered as, as contaminated. Uh, 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 prevention, expo uh, the, uh, the face shield, the N95, uh, waterproof gown, double gloves, and shoe covers are extremely important. So the protective equipment is extremely important. We don't know whether the N95s are more effective than the surgical mask, but the CDC, both from the US and China, have endorsed the use of N95 in the operating room. Uh, so that's highly recommended. Um, I know some of the other panelists are gonna talk about open approach versus laparoscopic approach. Um, uh, regarding uh, the potential transmission of the virus between the different modes. Um, and keep in mind that you are at a higher risk of becoming exposed to this virus when you're removing your protective equipment. So you have a, there's a higher risk of getting infected when you're removing your protective equipment. So 
uh, some institutions have, have actually um, uh, recommended a body system uh, where you look at each other, you make sure that you're actually doing it the correct way. Finally, I, I just wanna touch base on, on the difference between COVID-19 and influenza. I was asked this question three or four weeks ago and I couldn't really give an answer as to why we were, we were seeing what we were seeing and why we were doing what we were doing, you know, asking surgeons to stop doing elective surgery. That, that's a big deal, especially coming from, from, from in the internal medicine communities, from the infectious disease community. So I'll just touch briefly in some points. Uh, influenza is a known virus. We, we do have a, a degree of immunity that is already established in the population. COVID-19 is a totally different ball game. Uh, we don't have immunity. Uh, so we don't know how this virus, we didn't know how this virus was gonna behave. Um, seasonal influenza is it's a seasonal virus. We can, we can easily predict when the peak is gonna come and when that flattening of the curve is actually gonna occur. With COVID-19, that remains to be seen. The symptoms for seasonal influenza are quite typical. Fever, chills, nasal congestion, rhinorrhea. Over the last two weeks that we've been evaluating patients with COVID-19, I've had patients coming in with no fevers. I've had patients coming in with shoulder pain. I've had patients coming in with a urinary tract infection that end up having COVID-19. So they're not the typical upper respiratory tract infection symptoms that we're used to. The, uh, the, the loss of taste and the loss of smell seems to be a characteristic symptom on patients with COVID-19. The death rate for influenza is 0.1%. The death rate for, for uh, COVID-19 has been reported anywhere from two to 4% higher in some other countries. Asymptomatic transmission is anywhere from 20 to 40% in COVID-19. And that's one of the reasons why we're having so much difficulty containing this virus. We don't have that much asymptomatic transmission in the setting of influenza. We have no treatment for COVID-19. We can debate the treatment for influenza, whether it's really effective or not, but we know what we're using. We know the, we know the potential side effects um, of, of the, of the uh, treatments that we're using for, for uh, influenza. And finally, besides the vaccine that we have for seasonal influenza, we don't have a vaccine for COVID-19 at the present time. And even if we have one, these are RNA viruses that mutate. If we come up with a vaccine, how long is it gonna be effective? Um, uh, we, we just don't have answers to that. And finally, sustained immunity. Uh, we, we know that there are patients that have recovered from COVID-19. There are patients that we're using their antibodies as possible therapeutic option. Uh, but again, we don't know how long these antibodies are gonna last. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and is, it, is, this, is the immune response stronger in the, in, the, in the younger patients compared to the elderly? So uh, a lot of unknown. Um, and, uh, and again, the more you read the literature at this time, uh, you can get, uh, you know, a little more confused. Hopefully, as the weeks uh, continue to uh, progress, uh, we'll, learn, we'll learn more uh, about, uh, about uh, coronaviruses in general, uh, as well as COVID-19. Great. Thanks so much, Annabelle, for that great overview. Um, the questions are rolling in as we go uh, on the on the thread and stream right now, but uh, I think what we'll do is we'll collect them and um, wait until the um, until the last uh, section uh, uh, for the Q and A. And so I think right now I think what we'll do is we'll transition uh, to 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 our next speaker, who is a board certified general and colorectal surgeon. Um, um, he's a, the medical director of the Swedish Corn and Rectal Clinic and the designated institutional officer of Swedish Medical Center in, uh, in Seattle, Washington. And uh, he's going to speak to us tonight about the current best practices for perioperative testing and care. And I want to um, introduce uh, Dr. Amir Bastaros uh, to the virtual stage. Uh, Amir, if you could take us away and uh, school us a little bit on what you guys are doing for the current best practices. Thank you, Mark. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to speak. I am no expert on this topic. I am like you, 
trying to find my way to do the best I can for my patients and for my staff. Um, and <clears throat> this is probably one of the, the best things that come out of the COVID-19 uh, uh, era and uh, the identification of meetings being uh, completely ineffective. And uh, hopefully this will not be one of those ineffective meetings. Hopefully we'll get something out of it. And I thought I'd share with you, you know, what are my trusted sources? Uh, everyone is aware that uh, the guidelines have been coming out for several weeks now. Uh, and over, for a period of time, those guidelines, even from the same sources, were changing day by day by day as more information was coming in. Uh, we still are trying to collect uh, level one data. Very little of that is actually in the literature right now. And so we have to rely on, you know, where, where are we going to get our, our decisions from? Where are we going to get our guidelines? And for colorectal, at least, these are the, these are the uh, sources that I have been using to make my decisions for my patients and to guide uh, my institution as well and my partners. Um, I've been getting information from the AGA, uh, SAGES, of course. I think they've been way out in front of uh, many of the other societies. American College of Surgeons is, you know, kind of the... Um, you know, our overarching uh, body that, that watches out for us. ASCARS, of course, is our, our parent uh, organization for colorectal, but a lot of information is also coming from the Europeans through the European Society of Coloproctology. And then of course, you've got the CDC and the World Health Organization. But I am gonna put a plug out there for Twitter because I have found that it, it acts as a consolidator of many of these uh, different sources. And the conversations that occur on Twitter around the guidelines, particularly when you are able to uh, adjust to the uh, um, quality of the data as it comes through and the history of what's come out from, from those sources in the past helps us to, to determine what, what truth is, at least what truth is at, at this time in this place. There are others, of course, but I think these are the ones that I, that I found most useful to me. So in terms of the World Health Organization, you know, they're not gonna tell us um, how to do what we do, but they are gonna create some descriptions of what uh, a pandemic looks like. Uh, right now, it's clear that we're in phase six, uh, where there's sustained activity in um, uh, uh, multiple regions and multiple countries. American College of Surgeons has uh, put together uh, this kind of description of uh, the tiered response to COVID-19. I think most, uh, uh, most communities are in level one or two, although I can tell you that throughout the country, there are people in obviously just in the alert phase. Uh, and clearly there are some places in our, in our communities that are in, in the condition zero phase. <clears throat> I think it's very important to remember that uh, you have to respond to your community and where you are, but with an eye towards where you will be based on the uh, projection models. Uh, I remember early on in this process, now four weeks ago, it seems like it was a lifetime, um, looking at the uh, projections at, across the world and how different communities had followed those models almost to a T. And it was really disturbing to see scientific people in our communities thinking magically that it would not happen to them. And I think we see right now that it can happen to you. So uh, yeah, I can tell you that in Seattle, we started early, we took it seriously, we did social distancing, as well as uh, stopping elective surgery very, very early. Uh, my kid's school closed on November 9th, I'm sorry, it, on, on March 9th. So long before any governmental agency told us to stop. And I think that because of that, we have seen a uh, decrease in our peak as well as a shortening of the duration. We, we actually uh, are not, I think, going to get the uh, level of uh, disease that we've seen elsewhere. There are a lot of good resources online. Uh, this is a summary of all the different SAGE's recommendations. I'm gonna, uh, uh, give credit to, or credit is due to at CA Harris MD who put this together, kind of consolidating some of the, the SAGE's uh, recommendations that they've put out. Uh, and again, some of these are changing day to day. So come back and, and see what's, 
you know, what the recommendations are based on the newer information that comes through. We're gonna go through these quickly and then we're gonna uh, go on from there. Uh, recommendation I think pr pretty much everyone has heard but not everybody has followed through on is to cancel all elective cases and endoscopy. Uh, we did that very early. We also canceled all uh, patients in our, in our office other than emergencies. Um, early on, uh, it was, we were told to minimize laparoscopy and to use filters. I think that stance has softened quite a bit and we'll hear from Sammy a little bit more information about that. Uh, I do think that the use of filters and minimizing uh, the smoke uh, exposure is probably still worthwhile until we have more information. Um, but I have moved a little bit closer to being uh, willing to do uh, laparoscopy and robotics. Uh, as long as my staff and I have appropriate uh, PPE, and we have filtration of the, uh, of the, of the CO2. Uh, early on, there was a shortage of um, PPE in our community. We now have just enough, but that's also a consideration from one community to another. You wanna limit the number of people in the hospital and in patient rooms. We have closed the hospital to visitors. When patients have major surgery, they say hello to their, uh, pay, uh, their, their loved one after recovery and then are sent home. Uh, we've talked about closing the clinics as we've talked about and we've moved to telehealth. I think most people have done that. Uh, we are trying to follow the CDC guidelines as have been put out, although I think the CDC has been a bit slow compared to some of our surgical societies and other, other international uh, organizations. Um, we have been asked to be prepared to uh, transition to other roles uh, and <clears throat> we've been offered an opportunity to uh, maintain our uh, pay scale if we're willing to be redeployed. And I think most people are opting in for that. But in, in, a, in a true emergency, like we see in, in New York City or New Jersey or other places, uh, I think that most people are gonna step in and step up regardless of what kind of pay they're gonna have. Um, and then of course, always be safe and protect yourself. But you know, you know there are reasons not to wanna operate right now. Uh, we look around the, the world to Italy and to China, and we've seen uh, the healthcare providers, not just uh, physicians and surgeons, but the death toll among uh, doctors uh, being quite troubling. And uh, you know, the reasons for that, again, are multifactorial. The uncertainty about transmission, the uh, lack of per, per, uh, per, uh, appropriate PPE, and uh, the high risk environments that we're, uh, that we're asking doctors to, to work in. Having said that, we still wanna take care of our patients and we wanna do that in a way that limits the risk to our patients, that limits the risk to our staff, ourselves, and importantly to our community because that's gonna come back and affect us as well. And it's important to remember that there really is no emergency during a pandemic. And there is really no reason for us to put ourselves at risk if, uh, uh, to save one person if that means that we won't be there to save the thousand others that will be after us. That sounds a little unfeeling, but I think that that has been um, that's been put out there by most people uh, uh, to keep in mind: protect yourself first. And again, when we're operating in the era of COVID, we have to remember: uh, um, you've heard Annabelle talk about uh, the transmission rate and the uh, presence of virus in the smoke, in tissues, in stool. Uh, uh, we don't yet know about transmissibility in those arenas. And until we do, uh, I think that you, you should be cautious. Um, you, I assume that every patient, because we haven't been able to test on a regular basis, I assume every patient is positive, even if they have no symptoms. Um, when we're doing uh, surgery, there is a high risk of aerosolization, whether that's during intubation or during insufflation or even during open surgery. Uh, as mentioned, there's a shortage of PPE around the country. Even if you have uh, an N95 now, uh, we're being asked to use those N95s for a week or more and reuse them and keep them clean. So that by itself constitutes a shortage. Uh, there's a, a question about availability of proper filtration. We are just moving into the, uh, I think last Thursday, our institution was able to get the correct uh, filtration equipment uh, for minimally invasive surgery. We are at or near capacity for our critical care and ICU limit. And that is a consideration when you're deciding whether to operate on somebody, even if it's in, a, in an urgent setting, maybe not emergent. 
And then finally, one of the reasons that we shut down very early is our nursing facilities uh, disposition for patients that are leaving the hospital were all being shut down. Because as you recall, you know, the first death in the United States was in our community at a nursing facility. And they're all terrified of getting um, a patient with COVID and spreading it throughout their, their facility. So we can't get patients out of the hospital if they, uh, if, they de if they develop it. So we have to be very careful about operating somebody that might need a nursing facility afterwards. American College of Surgeons has um, provided some guidance for triage, and this is what they have for colorectal cancer surgery. And I'm not gonna read through all of it, but uh, uh, you can see that obviously there's some semi-urgent cases in phase one, near obstructing colon cancers as an example. Um, and then some things that can be deferred as needed, as you can see there's phase one being uh, kind of the early, the early phase of uh, uh, the, the community spread. And then uh, as you get down to phase two and phase three, you'll do things again, based on the resources that are available and the safety that is uh, uh, of, the, of the staff that you've got around you. And again, just another way to consider the surgical triage based on the mortality risk for the patient and availability of resources. All of these materials that I'm showing are available free online um, on either the SAGES, ACS website or other places that I've referred to. Now this is not intended for you to read, uh, but it's to give you an idea what we at Swedish have come up with and uh, what our uh, um, uh, OR committee that reviews cases for urgent planned cases uh, uses. Uh, and it's something that you at your institution probably should do as well. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. Uh, again, it will depend on what resources you have available and uh, where you are in the, in the pandemic. So this is what SAGES has recommended uh, as a surgical response to COVID. Uh, and this is important because it, it really summarizes all the different things that we, that we touch on. You, know, you wanna have a, uh, the minimum number of people in the operating room as possible and everyone should have PPE. Uh, you wanna ration, uh, rationalize service, postponing elective cases as possible, minimize any face-to-face -face consultations, move to uh, virtual meetings. Uh, you know, again, you know, consideration about safety during laparoscopy, which Sammy is gonna talk about. Um, and uh, using filtered devices for CO2 with insufflation. Use the lowest energy that you can and lowest pressure during minimally invasive surgery. Uh, uh, have a special consent for your patients regarding COVID-19 because we don't know. And uh, we, uh, some, some of the hospitals in our community are testing urgent planned surgeries for COVID-19. And while again, we assume everyone is positive, if you know that someone definitely is positive and you uh, uh, are not doing an emergent operation, it may influence when you will do their surgery or what precautions you'll need to take for the people around you uh, on top of the basic precautions we've talked about. Utilize a dedicated OR, some places even are using a dedicated hospital for COVID-19 patients. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about endoscopy uh, further on, but uh, all, staff, all staff again would wear um, PPE and avoid any advanced procedures. So this is a recommendation again uh, for testing. Uh, and this is, uh, um, uh, I think, important for us to, to remember. Uh, and uh, the problem is availability of testing is still ramping up. And I tell you that our hospital, we want to do this. We've said that we should do this, but we don't have the tests available to do this. Uh, some of the other hospitals in our community are able to do this for for planned, for planned procedures. And again, the uh, problem with testing is that patients are asymptomatic, uh, even though they may be positive. Uh, there may be a lack of availability of testing. The accuracy of testing has been called into question for false negatives. And the turnaround time up until very recently was up to a week. Uh, we now have some uh, that can get same day testing and even 15 minute testing. So a little bit of talk about PPE, uh, because we did have a shortage. We still probably do have a shortage, depending on how you define it. Um, and we've come up with uh, some, some ways to be able to salvage the PPEs that we have, particularly around N95s, which are the most, uh, uh, sh the greatest shortage that we've got. So we've been reusing uh, N95s, keeping them for a week, 
Uh, we have been reprocessing them. Our current protocol is to collect them, reprocess them with peroxide, and then bring them back into the into the uh, 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 collection. If you have the opportunity to have four for yourself, you can rotate through them, um, meaning that you can uh, uh, have four masks, use one each of four days in a row, and in between, the three that are not being used can be left to dry, and there are protocols available for you to consider that. Uh, and again, these are available online, and there's a link on the SAGES site to each of these, uh, either reprocessing or reuse um, opportunities. Uh, and then here's, uh, again, from our institution, uh, the guidelines that we've had in terms of conservation. Uh, when we use an N95, we cover it with a standard surgical mask uh, and try to save the N95 for as long as we can, uh, again, up to a week. And we have, uh, people have been asking for pappers and cappers. We have a limited supply of those, and those are really have only been left to uh, those patients that are proven positive in ICUs and for people that where the masks don't fit them. Uh, this is from Canada, uh, from the anesthesia group in Canada, uh, in terms of uh, a protocol for operating on patients in COVID-19. And again, I think the takeaway from this is not again to memorize what this says, but to have a plan as uh, uh, Annabelle mentioned earlier for transfers, uh, both to and from the operating room, et cetera, and what the role of each person in, involved is because that's a, a great point for um, spreading, the, spreading the virus. Now, many of us that are colorectal surgeons um, also do a lot of endoscopy. Even though we've stopped elective endoscopies, we still often have to do some urgently for diagnostic or uh, therapeutic purposes. And these are the guidelines that have come out of the AGA. Uh, they consider every endoscopic procedure to be high risk, whether it's upper endoscopy, lower endoscopy, uh, and they recommend using an N95 mask for um, every procedure to double glove, to do them in a negative pressure room if the patient is COVID positive or under investigation, and to limit procedures and triage as we've talked about before for surgical procedures. This is their recommendation for triage and what constitutes excuse me, time sensitive versus non-time time sensitive uh, procedures. And again, these are available via link on the AGA website. So coming again, we've gone over this already once before, uh, but this is a nice summary of uh, the recommendations out of SAGES and EAES regarding our surgical response. I'm not gonna go through this again, but it's, uh, you know, for those wondering, you know, what's our best, uh, the best, the best data that we have, this is a reasonably good summary. And I wanna thank you for your attention. Great, thanks a lot, Amir. We have a ton of questions kind of pouring in. Um, but let me let me ask since uh, so we don't get too too far behind on the questions. I've had a few questions and texts specifically regarding the criteria that you listed uh, for preoperative testing. Um, what what reference do you have? Because um, some people that are on the on the on the webinar right now are in positions of leadership and program directors at different uh, residencies and fellowships that were they're reading the the, the, the surgical society guidelines and they're doing what they're doing. And they hear what you're saying, but they're having difficulty convincing administration um, to do routine testing. So what reference do you have that you can give those that are attending the webinar uh, to, to, so they can reference for their administration on that? Yeah, you know, the best that I can tell you is that these are where the guidelines are saying nobody has data. Um, and uh, it, it's going to be very, if they want level one evidence, you're not going to find it. So the best that we can do is collect the information that we have and uh, give our best judgment based on those evidence, uh, in, uh, packets of evidence and uh, what our experts tell us. Got it. So okay. that's what SAGES has. I think there are a couple other societies have also recommended that. Okay, all right, wonderful. Okay, all right, great. Thanks so much, Amir, appreciate it, man. Um, so our final speaker tonight, before we go to the Q&A, um, is um, from the University of Toronto. He's an assistant professor up there and he's uh, in charge of the lower gastrointestinal malignancy site. He's the lead on it at uh, uh, Princess Margaret Hospital and is also board certified in general surgery as well as colorectal surgery. And tonight he's gonna be speaking with us regarding current evidence for minimally invasive surgery during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
and I'm introduce um, my man, Dr. Sammy Chatty, uh, to to the virtual stage. Uh, so, Sammy, if you take it away for us. Thanks, Mark. Can you can you hear me well? Yeah, great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for the opportunity to talk about um, uh, current evidence at this time. Which you know, I could really summarize it now. And we can stop here that there is no evidence and we can stop right there. But um, we'll, try to, we'll try to go through what there is available uh, to be able to give um, people what we do know about this area. So from a disclosure standpoint, I really don't have any relevant conflicts of interest to disclose. It's based off of data in the literature, just having um, been away from the hospital, away from an elective practice and on PubMed quite frequently. These are really about risk mitigation strategies and ultimately your approach should be based on your comfort with the evidence and your own surgical approach. And so really, is there any evidence about what we, what we need to do or do we need to be employing surrogates that are available in the data? So we've already heard, um, heard about COVID-19. We've heard about the specifics. I'm not going to focus on this. I am going to highlight just two points from this slide. Number one, the viral size that if you search in the literature, you will find at least 20 different resources about what kind of viral size um, there are for uh, quoted for COVID-19, but the most reliable seems to be a range from 0.06 to 0.14 microns in size. Um, that is not in its droplet format and speaking to our infectious disease team here in its droplet format, such as when you're coughed on or when you receive it in droplet format from that standpoint, it's more, it's, it's larger, it's more in the five micron size at times, but uh, anybody, you can correct me if I'm wrong later. Um, testing, uh, we heard is already based off of viral RNA and, and really we're gonna talk just briefly about the ACE2 receptor expression, just to talk a little bit about where this, um, where some of the risks are as a GI surgeon, and then really correlating symptom status with viral RNA expression that seems to be so um, somewhat um, debated in the literature. From the standpoint of exposure, there's data, um, a lot of the data is coming um, from the Far East and it varies from whether we are assessing our risk of exposure based off of actual cultures and actual tissue, actual sampling versus the expression of the ACE2 receptor, which you've heard a lot about in uh, the news and in the literature. And so if you look at the ACE2 receptor expression and its distribution through the body, I'm, I'm not gonna focus on the body, I'll focus on the GI tract in the GI tract, it's really found in the stomach and in colonocytes. Now, if we look at the endothelial level, we can actually see it through, essentially throughout the GI tract, all the way from the esophagus down to the anus. Um, and essentially, as we heard already, really the question of fecal oral transmission um, in general is still unclear. But um, um, when we get down to the actual specifics, the reason, that, the reason I highlight that is whether or not uh, once you're operating laparoscopically, is there any, we don't know if there's any significant volume of, um, of virus within the abdominal cavity. We don't know what states expose us to that virus and whether or not in its aerosolized format, we are being exposed at significant levels. Obviously, our root our, our, fund our foundational and fundamental answer should be yes to all the above and that we are exposed and we are exposed to significant levels. But ultimately, from a scientific standpoint, we don't know. We, are, we just started a protocol here at University of Toronto where we're trying to isolate virus out of the filters in COVID-positive uh, patients who have a laparoscopic procedure, but that's um, still very, very early um, in, its, uh, uh, in the process of that study. So the arguments for MIS surgery, I don't have to focus on this too much, but I'm going to focus on this from the standpoint of an acute care and general surgeon. I do still practice general surgery. Um, in, um, here in Toronto. So it's, uh, um, it is pertinent to what we do. We also, we have also stopped our elective practice. Our only, um, my elective practice is colorectal surgery and mostly colorectal oncology. And I have not done a colorectal oncology case in almost three weeks. Um, we are only doing, um, we have a standardization system here called the WTIS system. And we're only doing WTIS one and two, which means op procedures that need to be operated on within two weeks. So colon cancer and rectal cancer patients are being delayed and deferred within certain contexts that we could talk about later if you have any questions about that regarding our institutional algorithm. With MIS, we do feel that given the fact that it's uh, at the institution I work at, we do a lot of minimally invasive surgery. Um, and because of that, we feel very comfortable with operating with minimally invasive techniques, even in very difficult 
abdominal situations in emergency cases. However, obviously at the end of the day, we wanna be sure that we're keeping the patient at the center of the, uh, center of the discussion and using our, our baseline fundamentals, patient stability, hemodynamic stability, the, the efficacy of the operating room and whether or not we can even perform this procedure in a safe fashion. However, we'll get to that in a second, but basically I'll talk very briefly about just a couple of areas in general surgery. I'm not telling anyone here when to operate and when not to operate. Just as a disclaimer, I'm just giving you the evidence on the different approaches. So from the standpoint of appendicitis, there is a plethora of data in acute appendicitis, in perforated or complicated appendicitis, and lastly, even in appendicitis in the elderly. And we know from all of the studies that uh, there is improved uh, outcomes with laparoscopy in terms of length of stay, comor um, uh, potential complications during the procedure and uh, recovery. We're discharging these patients from the recovery room right after the procedure. The same thing apply, applies to cholecystectomy for acute cholecystitis and for the difficult gallbladder one, even when you're doing a subtotal cholecystectomy, this is not the time to be trying new techniques with laparoscopy. This is the time to be using the techniques and the skills that you've already established through your practice and employing them in the situation if you're comfortable doing so. Um, but the common themes that we see from most of the literature and even from the area of perforated viscous and um, in stable situations is that the OR time difference between open and laparoscopy is minimal, maybe 15 to 30 minutes. And um, in some of these cases, there's a shorter length to stay in hospital and there's lower overall complications. But it's really important that we talk about the elephant in the room in the situation. And really, what really is the impact as well of doing an open procedure in some of these cases, such as appendectomies and cholecystectomies, in the, current, um, in the current era that we're living in where some new graduates haven't done an open cholecystectomy ever. Um, and so I think that's some, something that's extremely important for us to keep in mind. And, and even though if you're a general surgeon in practice and you don't usually do your um, perforated diverticulitis laparoscopically, well then definitely now is not the time to be taking that on. But if that's what you usually do and you could do that effectively and safely, maybe that's something to be considering in this situation as well. Now, the concept of aerosolization we heard about briefly already. Um, ultimately, aerosol generating, the ultimate aerosol generating maneuver that our infectious disease team always talks about here is, uh, is coughing, where it can generate flows as high as 360 to 400 liters per minute. Um, however, there is some data that shows that when um, flow rates, um, and this is, comes from some uh, data where they uh, placed nasal cannulas and they assessed aerosolization, based off of low flow rates, they saw that with flow rates between six to 10 liters per minute, and again, this is from the concept of extrapolating, with six to 10 liters per minute via nasal cannula, there was minimal aerosolization risk to the, people, to the patients within the room. And so that's something we're gonna to try to extrapolate to the laparoscopic discussion as well. From the standpoint of exposure risk, we know with an open surgery that there is data to suggest that even with the surgical plume operating in patients who have specific viruses, we heard about this earlier as well, with HPV, with HIV, and with, hep and with hepatitic uh, viruses as well, there are exposure risks. However, the risks and their impact on you from, um, from the standpoint of the, the, um, the respiratory tract differ based off of the virus. Um, we do know about HPV and the, and the occupational risk that we hear about oral pharyngeal papillomatosis, um, for which we've been wearing N95 masks for quite some time. Um, and this really emanates from the gynecologic data. But this data exists in the uh, literature, exists a lot in the otolaryngologic uh, literature as well. And it's something that we're aware of. And as well, I think it's really important that we address the other elephant in the room is that even though we're operating open in some of these cases, how good are we open at evacuating the smoke and the smoke plume that comes with some of the procedures that we're performing. And some of these studies have looked at this. This one study looked at it in spinal surgery and they found that the efficacy is 44% at capturing the surgical plume during a procedure. Now that's a poorer study. This other study looked at it and looked at a range of situations and they found that the, the efficacy varied from as little as 30% to as high as 99% but the variability really emanated from the distance of the suction from the surface, the strength of the suction device, and the amount of plume being produced by the differential cautery and cut settings that you're using, and also the angle of the instrument off of the surgical plane where they said, where they noted that if it is at 45 degrees, it is a maximal amount of 
plume evacuation. So concerns with open surgery, really, there are exposure to droplets. You're in, you're, you're in an open abdomen. Your exposure to macro um, is more of a macro exposure situation. But it should be based off of your own surgical practice. Again, I've said this a number of times. Really do not start something new during this period of time. There is, a, there is an issue with extended recovery in hospital after open surgery, even with enhanced recovery after surgery programs. Laparoscopy has been shown to be better than open surgery in some studies. And also there's an increased SSI risk. And for us here in Canada, we, we do have to um, employ our uh, community care nurses to be able to help if, you know, if the patient does have a significant surgical site infection. And that then introduces another potential vector of transmission in the community if there is a healthcare provider that is now entering the home of the patient. So we're trying to minimize that exposure and getting the patient to a home, safe and home environment, isolated as fast as possible. From the standpoint of laparoscopy and aerosolization, this really emanates from the port site metastases data that comes back from the 90s when um, laparoscopic surgery was um, being started in the setting of uh, colon cancer and um, various GI malignancies where they were noticing port site metastases, especially in gallbladder cancer at the port sites. And this has been demonstrated in in vivo and in vitro studies to be related to the concept of aerosolization of the cellular matter within the abdomen, and it correlates to the velocity of the flow, the turbulence of your flow in the abdominal space, and then as well, the inflow of air and the maintenance of your pressure during the procedure. So minimizing the risk, really just um, uh, ending off in this uh, section here, what can you do to minimize the risk in these kinds of procedures? Well, number one, it's really important, just like we heard earlier, you need an institutional protocol. You should not be really starting something as a, as a lone ranger at your institution, you should be really considering this as an institutional protocol that you and all your colleagues, your anesthesiologists, your infectious disease specialists, and your operating room uh, nurses and the perioperative staff are all in agreement with. We ran this through multiple layers of committees before we were able to come up with an algorithm for our institution that we could agree upon for minimally invasive surgical procedures when performed. Um, you do need to have the appropriate surgical expertise and experience to be able to do these cases in these settings. You're operating with an N95 mask, which is not a comfortable state to be in. Some people are operating with a PAPR as well. Uh, we don't have access to that here. Um, you're trying to use new equipment and there is a, just a general state of anxiety in the room by your personnel, especially when they find out that this is a potential aerosol generating procedure. You need to have a defined process and ultimately speaking, it is best to run a simulation as to how everything is going to happen, especially with your fellow or your, co, uh, or your, um, your colleagues who would be operating with you during the case. So essentially when it comes down to laparoscopy and aerosolization, it comes down to the concept of a pressure gradient. You have a high pressure environment in the abdominal space and you have a low pressure environment outside. So how can we mitigate that pressure gradient to be able to minimize the likelihood of escape of aerosol. The only points of exit really when you think about it are the sites that you have created. So how can you control those sites and minimize these risks? So I've highlighted this as the main features that we have that we consider. So number one is the closed circuit. The one thing that we, that I personally, I mean, one of the reasons I, I, I am slightly in favor of bias towards a laparoscopic approach is because I do find that within that closed environment of the abdominal cavity, you now have a very confined space in which you are maintaining uh, a sense of security. Um, there's also knowing that you have the appropriate filtration devices um, and then also other pressure, um, pressure related mitigation strategies that we'll talk about in a second. So from the standpoint of the closed circuit, we talked about the closed environment of the abdomen. The only points of exit are your ports um, securing the ports at the skin level. Personally, I perform a, per I do a little bit of a, um, a drain stitch at the level of the skin to make sure it's ultra tight at the port site, something that we don't usually do in surgery, but something that in these situations, we're trying to be um, just that much more careful. When you're inserting your instruments, this is not a time to be, um, to be going aggressively with ports into the abdomen. You really need to take your time. And when you go slower, you find that the, especially with non-cutting uh, ports, you find that potentially the port will be hugged by the skin and subcutaneous fat that much more effectively and with, with less sway on the subcutaneous fat. These are cases where I put the ports in um, and I'm doing the majority of the procedure. These are not necessarily, these are not educational cases. 
or teaching cases for us. Um, do not, um, also the other point is that, you know, we think of our ports as five millimeter ports, three millimeter ports, five to 12 millimeter ports. Just remember what that lower, that lower number is on your, on your range. If you have a five to 12 millimeter port and you're doing an appendectomy and you put, a, um, you put a, um, an endo loop through there, well, when you pull the sheath over top of your endo loop, that's a stitch that is less than five millimeters in size. So you have effectively compromised the valve nature of that port and are allowing for escape through there. So really you need to minimize the time through, uh, during which there's any potential exposure. And if that means maybe using a stapler instead of endo loops or, um, or developing or establishing a new technique, that needs to be considered. And lastly, before you start anything, just like a pilot, test your insufflation, test your smoke evacuation, test all your instrumentation before using anything. The filter size, this is probably one of the key points that I would want anybody to take from this talk. The AORN and the NIOSH guidelines, which are the guidelines that stipulate operating room standards, stipulate that the smoke evacuation needs to be 0.1 microns at the level of the filter at your smoke, evacuator, smoke evacuator. You have to understand that on the other end of the smoke evacuator, when it suctions the air into the machine, it then spits the air out post filtration. So if you are filtering out viral particles that are under 0.1 microns, that is being exposed to the operating room environment. That's not going to any form of central suction. That is being spit out the other end of your smoke evacuator into your operating room. So it's important to make sure that your, your filter fits with what we're currently dealing with. We heard about earlier that the smallest particle size is 0 0.06 to 0.14 microns. So you want your filter to be less than that or encompassing those sizes. Um, the ULPA filters, the ultra low particulate air filters, that if you look at the SAGE's recommendations, it's highlighted there as well, it's quite extensive, that those filters are 0.05 micron filters. The AORN states these to be 0.1 micron filters, but if you look at the actual manufacturing data, it's 0.05, so it should cover you. To highlight, this is not a time to be jerry-rigging instruments to make things work. This is the time when you want to be using things that are already pre-existed, pre-manufactured, and have also been vetted by the manufacturer. This is an example of the Stryker Pneumoclear system. They have multiple layers of filtration, but you can see in the middle there, there's an ULPA filter in the middle that filters uh, to remove the viral particles during this process. There's also charcoal to, charcoal to remove other toxic gases, which we know are produced during um, any form of electric cautery or energy-based uh, energy um, uh, devices. Um, and there's also an absorbent layer to, to evacuate the water through that process. This is the air seal smoke evacuation. This has received a lot of press um, ever since we started even discussing things because people heard about the 0.01 micron filter in air seal. Please, please, please re uh, keep in mind, this is not the traditional air seal that we use in pelvic colorectal surgery or transanal total mesorectal excisions. This is not the traditional high flow insufflator. That insufflator, um, is, which is this first line up over here, that works with a non-valve, a valveless trocar. Now, theoretically, people, uh, the, the manufacturer states that once you've reached a, reached a state of insufflation and air seal mode, that there should be no air evacuating through that valveless port. This is not a time to be, um, to be uh, trialing and, and taking any risk. So we have completely abandoned and actually taken the ASN evac tubes, which are the traditional air seal uh, ports completely off of our shelves. So nobody uses it by mistake. We only use the smoke evacuation tubing. We, I, we use, uh, personally, we use either this or the striker uh, instrumentation. And for the smoke evacuation tubing, you need, it has the filter on the end of it, as we can see over here, and also a bifurcated dual lumen tube. The way to tell the difference between the two that you're using the right tube, that use, using the right um, um, instrumentation is that this one you can connect to your regular uh, ports. I know this seems very um, straightforward, but I'm just going to state this for uh, to get this off of my chest. This you can connect to regular valved ports that you would use for normal laparoscopy, whereas the upper one over here, the high flow insufflational tubing or the ASM EVAC, needs its own special port to be able to use. Um, and this uses a 0.01 micron filter. How effective is flow? This is just my last few slides. Um, so this is the data that I mentioned earlier about the low flow oxygen rates at six liters per minute um, with minimal aerosolization risk at these levels. But this is based off of the nasopharynx and 
um, from our infectious disease team where when we, when we have a COVID positive patient, there is a less risk, much less risk of aerosolization when you're using nasal cannula at six to 10 liters per minute. And this is what I've tried to extrapolate to our abdominal surgical procedures, which we'll talk about in a second. It's gonna skip over those two slides for uh, the purpose of time. This uh, slide here looks at the risk of aerosolization during the procedure as a function of time. This was during the time of, um, of port site metastases data where they took radio labeled um, col um, colonic cells, they introduced them to the abdomen and they noticed that, of, sorry, of a, um, of a pig, and they noticed that over the course of time, the risk of aerosolization gradually increased. So really just lends to the fact that minimizing the length of the procedure is that much more important uh, during, these, uh, during these times to minimize aerosolization. Um, lastly, I believe trocar removal. When you remove your trocars, this is not a time to be just jamming them out of the abdomen or just reefing them out of the abdomen. This is a study that looked at the risk of um, spray of um, droplets from the abdominal cavity as the ports were being removed. And you can see this is on a board that I believe was um, uh, one meter from the, from the patient's abdomen. And you can see here that there is a, uh, there's an, uh, there are, um, there are droplets that are sprayed on the, on the, on the board um, one meter away from the abdomen just by pulling out a trocar. Actually, this is just one more point here. Well, when, when we do these cases, we operate at low insufflational pressures as well. We use a deep neuromuscular blockade so as to even that much further decrease the intraperitoneal pressurized state of the abdomen. So we operate at eight to 10 millimeters of mercury rather than the traditional 15 millimeters in North America and 12 in Europe. Um, and and uh, we basically just either ask our anesthesiologist to give a rocuronium infusion for longer cases or just very frequent rocuronium doses to keep the patient very deep during the procedure and then reversing that with Sagamidex. I apologize for that, um, uh, for that spelling error. And it has been correlated in other studies as well, such as this meta-analysis with lower pain scores, earlier recovery of GI function, and earlier discharge as well. So this is our algorithm at my hospital where uh, for COVID positive patients, we operate in life or limb situations. That is it. There is no other indication for surgery in a COVID positive patient other than life or limb. Um, for COVID negative but unknown, we treat these as a worst case scenario and we treat it as life or limb as well. If it's a patient who is becoming septic and needs surgery, we treat them as COVID positive, but we do, if we have if we do not have COVID data, we do get a CT chest in emergency situations because of the um, higher sensitivity for COVID um, in asymptomatic, uh, even in asymptomatic patients that we've been quoted. COVID negative and symptom negative, we proceed, um, but we use N95 masks because of, of it being considered an aerosol, aerosol generating procedure and because of the higher false negative rate with this uh, testing for COVID-19. Uh, and lastly, with COVID unknown and symptom unknown, um, we, uh, in general, we'll try to delay surgery until the swab comes back because it, um, all of our patients um, for any form of emergency or elective surgery uh, that is still being performed um, need a COVID swab according to our institutional guidelines. So lastly, this is just our approach. So N95 masks for all laparoscopic procedures, COVID-19 and CT chest for uh, swab, COVID-19 swab and CT chest for any emergency case, um, low pneumo procedures, with a flow of five to 10 liters per minute at max, you have to wait a little bit longer, but it's worth the wait um, with the deep neuromuscular relaxation. And then at the end of the procedure, number one, throughout the procedure, minimize personnel um, from a surgical and perioperative standpoint. Number two, we close the insufflation port and we allow the smoke evacuator to completely decompress the abdomen. We try not to introduce suction and suction through this regular suction as that suctions into the building's central system. Um, and we really don't know where that goes, to be, to, to be honest. Um, we, um, when there's complete decompression of the abdomen, we very gently and slowly remove the ports. If we need to make an incision, we used to make our incisions to, uh, through a phanous steel or peri-umbilical incision um, to extract um, uh, specimens with, in an insufflated state, but now we routinely do it when decompressed. And then once the procedure is completed, we then have every surgeon and, surgeon, and, and nurse have a donning and doffing buddy um, to make sure that everything is done, being done appropriately. And lastly, we remain in the room for 30 minutes prior to leaving. So really recommendations, always ask yourself, do I really need to be doing this procedure? Um, never, do not start something new during this time. Be careful creating your own filtration process. Try not to jerry-rig anything. Use pre-manufactured and manufacturer approved um, um, hardware. Um, and then all the hard and fast rules 
in assessing your patient really apply now and, and always. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Sammy. Every time, I, every time I talk to you, man, I get more and more paranoid about doing surgery during this time. So appreciate that. I'm getting a ton of messages. In the interest of time, I think we're going to just uh, take a few of the um, uh, take a few of the the more higher um, uh, more pertinent questions here. I want to ask you, Sammy, that we have a few questions on this regarding specimen extraction. I know you touched on it very briefly, but can you tell us? From a practical standpoint, how do you extract your specimen at the end of a laparoscopic case? From a technical standpoint, would you bag it, deciphery? Well, exactly, Woody, how do you handle that? So at the, at the current time, when we're completing the procedure, we ensure that we have completely evacuated any form of liquid, um, fluid, um, any, any, any potential um, fluid collection in the abdominal cavity that could be a source for droplet on, on, on opening the abdomen. That's point number one. Um, we usually, my approach when I do a laparoscopic collecting, I extract usually via fan and steel um, or a laparoscopic procedure that requires an extraction. I try to go with the fan and steel and I do that in an open approach. Sorry, I do that, I apologize. I do that in the insufflated state because I don't wanna be injuring anything intra-abdominal during my fan and steel. In this situation, that does not apply, and we are completely decompressing the abdomen. Do not reef on the abdomen to complete to further de the decompression. Um, it's just not safe to do so. Just wait until everything is completely decompressed before doing anything further. Everything's wearing. Everybody's wearing an N95 mask and a shield over their faces as well. The the staff surgeons are making the incisions and doing every part of these procedures. Um, so, and then, and then ultimately, it's um, we don't necessarily use a bag. We'll use a bag in perforated, um, in perforated cases if it fits within a bag. Um, but, um, but for some of the perforated collectomies, I haven't done any yet in this current um, era. But we would, we we do have 15 millimeter bags if need be to um, uh, 15 millimeter port bags that we can uh, place within there. But ultimately, there is always a risk. And you know, this is a time where when if you're going to remove it, you need to make a bigger incision. Just make the bigger incision. Sure. So let me ask, and Annabelle, this may be a question for you as well. Sam, you've sp spoken about it, and Amir, you did as well. N95 masks are kind of a big thing right now. And at least in Orlando, you know, if I ask for an N95 mask, that's kind of like, you know, they're like doing me a favor almost to get it. And Annabelle, you know, we're, you and I are at the same institution versus Sammy and, and, and Amir are much larger institutions. So, um, that, that is a current recommendation from a societal standpoint. But Annabelle, kind of how would you, from an infectious disease standpoint, recommend we, um, at the local campus level, um, approach administration to try to get these different protocols implemented? Because I think a lot of us that are on the call right now um, are, you know, we're, we're at these institutions that uh, they're not quite as uh, up to date on the data. Uh, or have not quite implemented these things just yet. So um, I guess this is for the panel. I mean, Annabelle, I'm talking to you because you, you sit on the antibiotic stewardship and you're on these committees, but Amir and Sammy, you guys have, have implement, implemented these protocols. So any comments on that? I mean, we've been lucky enough that administration has been very open to our, to our recommendations. I mean, time of, is of the essence. Um, uh, Amir just mentioned his experience a little bit earlier in, in Seattle, Washington, and how how fast they acted on 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 everything, social distancing, and I'm sure how uh, how fast they acted on these protocols. Um, uh, from from my standpoint, we we've been lucky enough that administration has actually been very open to our recommendation, and as more and more data is coming out. Um, uh, we've been we've been seeing the experience in Washington. Uh, we've been seeing the experience at the uh, uh, you know, Mass, Mass General, and uh, and New York, uh, which has actually prompted us to to act uh, on a on a on a more of a, an emergency kind of basis to to try to to try to get uh, try to get everybody um, up to date on, on on everything that needs to be done. Great, and Annabelle, I'm going to transition the conversation a little bit from the operating room to the office. And so we spoke a little bit about earlier different manifestations of uh, COVID. And one of the, of course, one of the ones that you're talking about is of course, is upper respiratory, cough, whatever the case may be. But you're also saying that you're now seeing a lot more UTIs that actually have COVID. 
Um, are you seeing a lot of GI manifestations that ultimately then have COVID as well? So, no, I'm, like that? when you see some of the reports, the uh, GI symptoms have been anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. And again, that's, you know, abdominal pain, that's diarrhea, but you can see that with any virus. I have not seen uh, a patient that has presented with, uh, with uh, solely gastrointestinal manifestation. Uh, they usually have a fever, and, and the majority of the times they're going to have some cough. Um, and I, I do have a very low threshold to or, order CT scans of the chest um, on this patients because they can have changes on their CT scan of the chest much earlier than, than the usual symptoms of, a, of an upper respiratory tract infection or a pneumonia. So to answer the question, have I seen patients with, a, with gastrointestinal symptoms? Yes. Are they the majority? No. Uh, they usually get come uh, with, with, other, uh, with other symptomatology from, from the lung standpoint. Great. Now, many of us, of course, on the call right now are colorectal surgeons and, of course, a lot of um, uh, general surgeons as well. A lot of us do in-office anoscopy, in-office sigmoidoscopy as well, and completely, at this time, asymptomatic patients that are coming in for rectal bleeding, whatever the case may be. And I know a lot of us are, have shut that completely down, but some of us are still doing it. But in the event that we do have patients that come in for, say, anoscopy for rectal bleeding, whatever the case may be, it is true, though, that, or we think, that there is viral shedding within the stool. And if so, what precautions would you recommend we take during those very, what we would think, a benign exam in the office? I'll, I'll be honest, Mark, I would treat every patient right now as if they had COVID-19. Uh, yes, they have, they, there is stool, uh, there's virus shed on the stool and we don't know how viable this, this virus is or not, but the rate of asymptomatic shedding on some of these patients is significantly higher compared to some of the other viruses. So regardless if they have, if they have it in their stool or not, they may still be shedding in their secretions just by talking to you so if you're doing any of, the, of those procedures, which I advise at this point not to do if they're elective, I would use uh, full uh, protective equipment on those patients. Great, thank you. That's thank been you. what we've been doing as well, Mark. Um, you know, because if you look since to the AGA, uh, they're, you know, they consider, uh, one of the reasons they consider even colonoscopy and aerosolizing procedure is because of the flatus of uh, uh, chance of passing flatus and that in itself could potentially give you a respiratory uh, inoculation of the virus. So we're using N95s with eye protection, with a gown for all patients that are coming into the office. And again, we've shut everything down. These are just uh, patients with newly diagnosed cancers or, or something, an abscess or something that needs to be seen in the office emergently. Got it, got it, got it. And Amir, um, the question, uh, several questions came in about this specifically and since, you are the designated institutional officer and kind of the liaison between the ASCRS um, um, and the ACGME in a sense. I mean, you kind of know these rules. I mean, we have a lot of fellowships. We have a lot of trainees that are on the call right now as well. Specific, I know that um, we spoke about this you know, pre-webinar, uh, but can you give us a little bit of insight at least to what the case requirements might be uh, from the uh, ACGME, the APDCRS standpoint for our trainees? Well, I don't have the answers, but I can tell you that um, the ACGME, ha I'll, I'll break it up into, into components. Um, the, in terms of case numbers, the ACGME is not going to change those numbers for the current year, but they will uh, take into account the current environment. They have said that they are going to be as supportive as possible for programs and for, uh, for trainees. We'll know more in a couple of weeks when we have our program directors meeting because ACGME is going to be speaking there. In terms of um, uh, resident participation and uh, um, care of patients with COVID, the ACGME has come down very strongly in terms of protection of residents and trainees. And they have said very clearly, even in, uh, I'm sorry, unless we are in a, uh, a war zone essentially, that the rules will not be changed. The work hour rules are still going to be in place. The uh, availability of PPE is uh, of highest priority and the learning environment still needs to be the same. So the trainees have to be uh, under the auspices of the uh, people that are uh, best able to teach them 
in the training program uh, of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the specialty that they're in. So sending them off to do family practice or sending them off to do critical care, while it may be necessary in the most emergent state, uh, it is uh, um, the prim primary goal is uh, teaching and not service. So protecting the trainees is of paramount uh, importance for the ACGME. I wish so, I had better answers in terms of numbers. We just don't know. Got it, got it, got it. And so, you know, we're obviously new into this and we're still learning, we're still studying it. And, and there's a lot of things that are in flux, but from a practical and pragmatic perspective, if there's, for example, we have questions rolling in about um, recommendations for when, for example, we need to do a case, but yet they're not pressurized rooms. Or, for example, we need to do a case or, or our attending, uh, there's a trainee's attending is asking him to do a case and there's not PPE, but yet there's no, there's no test positivity, there's no suspicion for these. I mean, what does a panel recommend in those instances? Let's talk about first, Sam, if you could talk to us about the, neg the, the uh, pressurization of the room. Yeah, so from our standpoint, from, from trainee involvement, um, we just, we, we're basically at the point where we only operate with the fellows and um, and or another staff member. So we're, we're trying to mitigate any form of risk of trainees and not only risk to trainees, but in addition from a practical standpoint as well, we just don't have the, uh, the PPE to be able to, um, uh, for another two or three individuals to be in the room with N95 masks and all the additional, um, all the additional requirements. From um, Canada specifically, um, right now we're saying N95 <laughs> for everybody. Um, in these laparoscopic procedures. And remember, you know, before at our institution, we do, you know, on a night of call for general surgery and colorectal or, you know, general surgery, which falls under, under which colorectal falls here. Uh, we do, let's say between two and four, two and five cases in a 24 hour um, shift. Now we're doing maybe two or, you know, maybe five cases a week. And so from a pragmatic standpoint, it's not as high a volume of utility. We also did run into an issue in our province in Ontario now that we, um, I'm going to keep this apolitical, um, but we've, uh, we don't have enough PPE to last us another 10 days because some of our recent shipments have been blocked. And so from that standpoint, we only have enough N95 masks to last us another seven to 10 days. So we're also adding in risk, uh, sorry, um, strategies to reuse uh, PPE here as well, specifically N95s just like we talked about earlier with the four, you know, the four mask strategy and using um, a, uh, a Tupperware to keep them in during those four days. Um, we're not at that point yet. We're gonna be seeing our peak later this week, but from a trainee involvement standpoint, we're basically at the point where we do not operate with the trainee in the room at a resident level. At a fellow level, we do involve them, especially if it's just the staff and the fellow operating. But even in those situations, uh, participation and involvement is dependent on the situation that you're in. Great. Thank you so very much. Um, I think, um, you know, we're about 14 minutes past time right now. So I want to um, um, respect the time of the panelists as well as the, those that have attended the panel. Uh, listen, man, this is, this is a fantastic talk. Thank you all very, very much. I want to remind everybody that's on the call as well, that this Wednesday at 7 p.m., there's an official SAGES webinar um, that's going to be hosted via Zoom. If you can, it's, 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 not by, it's not through Facebook, it's through Zoom, so it's going to be open to the public. It's a free webinar. So for anyone and everyone, please uh, tune in on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, for a SAGES update on the guidelines during COVID-19 pandemic. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Maldonado, Dr. Amir Rastaris, and also Dr. Sam Chatty for your time, your expertise. This is a fantastic panel. Thank you so very, very much. And um, if, if I could uh, fist bump you guys, I would, but I appreciate it. You have a good night. Thanks again. <laughs>